You're on CY Interview. This is Chris Shandek. For those concerned about America's debt and deficit, former Republican two-term New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson has a plan to bring fiscal responsibility to the United States, in addition to standing up for civil liberties. Mr. Johnson, who ran for the Republican nomination for president yet did not get much exposure, is currently running for president as the Libertarian Party nominee. On election day, he will be on the ballot in all 50 states. Jay Bilstein joins me for the CY interview with the highest polling third party candidate for president of the United States, Gary Johnson. This is Chris Shandek, featured columnist Jay Bilstein is on this call with me. With alternatives to third parties in America for the 2012 presidential elections, we welcome in the man with the most notoriety so far, the Libertarian nomination for president of 2012, Gary Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate the opportunity. I want to start by asking you, you know, Ron Paul has announced that he will stop campaigning in the remaining primary states for the Republican nomination. At the same time, he will not end his quest for delegates. Do you feel like this is the moment for all Ron Paul supporters to start looking closer at your candidacy and coming to the realization that Ron Paul isn't likely going to win the Republican nomination? Well, I think that that is a process that's going to happen and that there is, um, it's not a, um, it's not a handicapped, uh, <laughs> You're not handicapping yourself if uh, you don't have Ron Paul to vote for, and and that alternative would be uh, would be me. Um, you know, having won the Libertarian nomination for president. You know, let's, uh, go let's balance the but. You know, let's balance the budget. Let's end the wars in Afghanistan. Let's bring the troops home. There's a there's a difference. There there is a third cho- <laughs> there is a third choice. Would you be open to having Ron Paul as the vice president of the Libertarian ticket if he chose that, if he was interested in that? You know what? The process for president and vice president for the Libertarian Party has passed. Uh, I'm the presidential candidate, and Jim Gray is the vice presidential candidate. Okay. Jay, go ahead. I know that you got some things you want to talk about with the governor. Well, first of all, Governor Johnson, it's a, a pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, I want to say here on CY Interview... I, along with Chris Yandek, have had the opportunity to speak with members of Congress, presidential candidates, other people involved in or commentating on politics. And when we have, I put forward the following plan in order to bring much-needed leadership to Washington, D.C. It's a three-point plan to create a government of leaders. Number one, the Congress, president, and vice president need to take a 50% pay cut and give up their rich after-office benefits. After all, we practically borrow half the money to pay them as it is. Number two, there needs to be a lifetime embargo on any lobbying for members of Congress as well as the president and vice president. Number three, we need term limits. Now, I believe, and Chris agrees, the only way we're going to get changed is by having individuals in positions of power who walk their talk, individuals who, if they ask the average American to tighten their belt two notches, are going to tighten their belt four notches to lead the way, to lead by example. Governor Johnson, what's your opinion of this plan, and would you endorse something like this? Well, I, I certainly uh, I think term limits would go a long way. Um, uh, I, I think term limits would improve everything. I, uh, you know, uh, the notion of banning a uh, congressperson from lobbying uh, forever after they're out of office, I like that idea too. So maybe you ought to increase the pay uh, and. Uh, and with the caveat that uh, with the increased pay, you can't come back and work for the government uh, anymore. I don't know about the 50% reduction in pay. I am um, proposing a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013, so uh, included in that would be a 43% reduction in government spending, which would be a 43% reduction for Congress uh, would be a 43% reduction for uh, the administration, the presidential administration. So, so in effect, you're pretty much there. I mean, when we're talking about salaries for Congress, what you're in effect saying is you're 7% different uh, from what I, I put forward. That more or less correct? Well, you're, you're talking about salaries. I'm talking about cutting the overall appropriation to Congress by 43%. Uh, does that mean cutting salaries by... Fifty percent. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm advocating cutting salaries by fifty percent, but I'd be cutting forty-three percent of the people. Well, let, let let's really get into this because you know I think we're two minutes past midnight, 
uh, in, in a, on a clock that is a countdown to financial doom, and financial doom comes at midnight, and, and we're past that. I mean, doesn't America have to wake up to a very unpalatable reality right now that we've got a choice of either getting kicked in the shins or getting hit in the head with a crowbar? I mean, one hurts and the other could be fatal. It, you know, I, I don't know. I'm thinking for some reason this moment of, a, 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 to paraphrase Shakespeare, um, something to the effect of uh, the, the trouble uh, is not, the trouble, dear voter, is not with our politicians, it's within ourselves. Do you think that there's something right now within the American psyche or within the psyche of most voters where we're allergic to voting for or supporting people who are going to come out and tell us the unpalatable truth that we've overspent, overconsumed, overborrowed, that the, the credit card bill has arrived and we've got to deal with it in some way. And it doesn't have to be fatal like a crowbar to the head, but uh, there, there is necessarily going to be some level of pain and we are going to have to make amends for our uh, our past high living. Is it, isn't that really what we're dealing with right now, Governor Johnson? Well, I, I agree with you 100%. And um, when I talk about a 43% reduction in federal spending, I don't think what people are considering is, is that uh, a 43% reduction in Medicare spending is a whole lot better than not having any health care for those over 65 at all. And that's the alternative. Uh, I do believe that it's past midnight uh, and that um, um, we're going to suffer a monetary collapse as a result of uh, borrowing and spending money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we, that we spend. That's not sustainable. And it's here and it's now and it has to be dealt with. And the first thing on the list of dealing with this is to slash federal spending. Uh, I am promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. I don't think any of the other two candidates are, are talking remotely close to doing that. What do you say when uh, somebody like Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve, comes out and uh, you know tells lawmakers, hey, listen, uh, if we don't do something uh, prior to January of 2013 in regards to uh, certain tax structures that will change, and a whole bunch of other things. The United States is going to suffer another recession. Do you say we need to bite the bullet now? The pain of a recession in 2013 pales in comparison to a potential financial collapse uh, in the style of or toward the style of Greece. What do you do? I mean, what what can you do? And what can your supporters do to help wake people up to our true reality? Well, what, what can be done, what never has been done, but what can be done and what I'm proposing needs to be done is that we balance the budget now. Uh, does, that, uh, does that do away with uh, what may end up to be a uh, government collapse? No, because... We still have the $16 trillion in debt that we have to deal with, and depending on the interest rate that has to be paid on that, uh, you could find ourselves printing up money if we weren't taking on any new debt at all. But the first step has to be to slash spending. Uh, I am promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. Uh, I think spending will be lower with that promise kept and the promise kept to veto any legislation where expenses exceed revenue, uh, I'm willing to pose that spending will be lower in that scenario than any other possible scenario. And that if we don't do this, the alternative is a la Russia, uh, monetary collapse. The money that we have one day is just not worth anything tomorrow. I read, uh, and please tell me if it's true, that during your tenure as governor, you exercised your veto more times than all the other governors in the United States of America put together. Is that true, or is that apocryphal? Is that apocryphal? You know, it, it, it might be an embellishment, but I'm waiting for somebody to prove me wrong. I vetoed 750 bills while I was governor of New Mexico. I had thousands of line-item vetoes as governor of New Mexico. Uh, only two were overturned. So it really made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. 
And it made a difference when it came to government telling you or I what we should or shouldn't do in the bedroom. You have walked your talk by virtue of these vetoes you spoke about. Your record in New Mexico is there for all to see. Isn't it a testament to the fact that we human beings have a horrible tendency to stick our heads in the sand, even in the face of incredible danger, that more people in the country have not looked to your candidacy as a sober solution to the challenges facing us? Well, uh, all along, I really thought that there would have been that focus. It has not happened to this point, but I do think that what's significant is that uh, right now, I am probably going to be one of three candidates in the country on the ballot in all 50 states, given the fact that 80% of Americans right now are saying they would consider voting for a third-party candidate. I think there still is plenty of time for that focus to happen, but to this point, uh, it's really uh, been under the radar screen the whole time. Governor Johnson, if you could for a moment, don't be candidate Johnson. Just be, you know, just just be you. You alone in your quiet time. And look, you're, you're a man who has dedicated uh, a significant portion of your life to public service. Would it be wrong to say that you're scared of what's coming down the pike? Because I promise you, I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm afraid. I look at the circumstances as they are, and, and I just see scenarios that range from bad to worse to unthinkably horrific. Do you think I'm some kind of chicken little saying this to you, or in your quiet time, do you look at it and kind of say, gee whiz? Even the best case, the best case scenario is going to be better than the worst, but it's it's still going to be pretty ugly any way you slice it. You know, I, I'd like to think that uh, that isn't something that I just ex express in my quiet time. That quiet time or uh, loud time, I, I do think that this is something that's going to happen. The only way that we stand a chance uh, against it not happening is to slash spending now. Oh, who's going to who's gonna slash spending, uh, Obama or Romney? Um, I don't think so. Uh, who's going to get us out of Afghanistan? Who's going to bring the troops home? Who's going to end the war on drugs? Both of them. Uh, how about repealing the Patriot Act? Both of them support uh, the Patriot Act. Both of them want to bomb Iran. Uh, let's not bomb Iran. Ronald, Ronald Reagan said the most, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Now, you're carrying the libertarian banner. Do you agree? Uh, I do. I, I think that there's an unintended consequence of what government does, and although it's well-intentioned, I think without exception, it's always well-intentioned, the unintended consequence just adds time and money for you and I to have to comply with what it is that government wants, and here it is. We're at a point now where out of every dollar that this U.S. government spends, 43 cents of it is basically just printed uh, printed up. Some of it's borrowed. You know, you can say it's all borrowed, but uh, a lot of it is just being printed up uh, right out of thin air and uh, uh, buying our buying our treasury debt. Governor. Uh, that's not sustainable. Governor Johnson, of course, now your big hope is to get to 15% nationally polling so you can debate with President Obama and Mitt Romney. What is it going to take to get there? And what can people do to help? Well, uh, I think that uh, I, I think there will be recognition, uh, growing recognition of being on the ballot in all 50 states, that there are only going to be three parties that are going to accomplish that. I, I don't think Ron Paul's candidacy is going to be successful, and for the most part, Ron Paul is talking about these same issues and talking about the solutions that go along with the problems, but I don't think he's going to win the Republican nomination. So that's another, that's another kind of a key event. Where does all Ron Paul support go when that candidacy comes to an end? Well, I think that the libertarian ticket, uh, me, uh, offers an alternative that's, uh, it's not a uh, fallback position. It's not a uh, it's, it's uh, not a handicap decision. It's a reload, if you will.
Yeah, I know that, you know, given the fact you didn't get much traction in the Republican nomination process, you went off and you said, well, I'm going to run for president, I'm going to, I'm going to go get the Libertarian nomination, and you didn't. I just wonder if you feel like, you know, looking at the Democrats and the Republicans where we are currently right now, it just seems like that both of these parties are in denial about what is coming, and they just continue to kick the can down the road, and I wonder what you think about that. Well, I think that that's exactly what's happening, and I don't... I don't understand the, uh, I don't understand kicking it down the road because it's just, uh, there's, there's not that much room left. You guys recognize that, uh, you know, so much talk of late has been given of Greece. Well, Greece is at 160% of gross national product. We're six to eight years away from statistically being in that same place. Now, Greece can't print money. We can. So um, our outcome is is going to be that uh, the dollars we have are so inflated that they virtually become valueless. Well, let, let, let me let me hop in, let me hop in for a moment because you touched on something very interesting, Governor Johnson. First of all, as far as Greece is concerned, there's been talk about Greece pulling out of you know, potentially the pulling out of the, being forced out of the European Union, certainly. Uh, getting off the euro so that they would go back, I suppose, to the drachma so they could print money. And, of course, I think you would agree that uh, inflation is a stealth tax. It's a way where when politicians don't have um, the courage to face the electorate and say what needs to be done, the default position is inflation because it's a, it's a stealth tax. It comes secretly in the middle of the night, and then you wake up the next day and you can buy less with your money. That, that being said, with all the money that has been printed since the crisis of 2008, September 2008, why have we not seen more inflation uh, than we have seen over the course of the last, oh, I don't know, three and a half years? Do you believe the government is uh, underreporting inflation? Do you think that there's more inflation than, than there has been claimed? Uh, because when we look at housing prices... And we look at a lot of things, we don't see the dreaded inflation many of us had worried about. And I do believe it's going to come at some time, but why haven't we started to see a significant uptick in inflation in this country? Well, uh, I'm just going to say that it is coming uh, and that we will see it. And that um, I think so much of uh, market action of late has been about liquidity because of the European banks and uh, and just how much, uh, just how much has to be written down, and how much uh, cash is being have to, is being uh, have to raise, being raised. So uh, I, I just do see it as an eventuality. There's no, uh, I don't think there's any escaping it whatsoever. And then I've uh, heard it said that uh, because of the change in the way we compute uh, inflation, that really the inflation that we have today. Uh, rivals that of Jimmy Carter because you know they, they exclude energy and food prices. Well, that's that's so, where we experience inflation every day. So, Governor, are you saying that you believe that if we were calculating inflation right now, the same as inflation was calculated under the presidency of uh, Jimmy Carter, that Jimmy inflation Carter. in the United States would be over ten percent, calculated back <laughs> like we did thirty-five years ago? I, I have heard that it would be exa exactly on par with what was happening at that time. And, and of course, at, uh, you know, at that time, I think we had, uh, I don't remember exactly, maybe we had money market rates that were certainly over 15%, if not higher. And so inflation was yeah, something yeah, very much, yeah. Yeah, something that we were very much dealing with. Now, now looking at the way things are, um, by the way, Chris and I had this wonderful opportunity. We spoke with David Walker, who was the former United States Controller General and head of the General Accountability Office for 10 years, bipartisan. He was there under President Clinton. He was there under President uh, George W. Bush. And he said that we're two years away from where Greece is now unless we do something. He used two years. He said, of course, our economy is different. We're bigger and so forth. When I spoke to the former controller general, and, and when Chris did, about the specter of hyperinflation and, and the government, in effect, inflating their way out of all the problems, he said that we've got this albatross around our neck which doesn't go away unless it's renegotiated. And what he said is, look, 
You've got a social insurance contract, and that encompasses such things as Medicare and, and Medicaid. And even if you inflate the system, you still have to make good on Medicare and Medicaid unless it's reformed. How on earth can you, can any politician who, sign, who really seriously wants to get elected go to people who 10 years from now are going to be in their so-called retirement years and say to them, listen, here's your choice. Um, nothing in 15 years or except half of what you thought you were going to get from Medicare. Do you think anyone is really going to vote for a politician who tells that kind of truth? Well, uh, I'm obviously putting that to the test. Um, you, of course, you cannot cut, you can't balance the federal budget if you're not going to cut Medicaid and Medicare and military spending, the big three. Uh, I reformed Medicaid in New Mexico, or I oversaw the reform of Medicaid in New Mexico. We took it from a fee-for-service model to a managed care model. We saved uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and we set up better health care networks uh, in the state. But at that time, I believe if the federal government would have block-granted the state of New Mexico 43% less money, done away with all the strings in the mandate, that I could have effectively overseen the delivery of health care to the poor in New Mexico. I maintain the same for Medicare, those over 65. Medicare has never been a federal program, but I think the federal government has to devolve Medicare to the state, do away with all the strings in the mandate, and I just suggest to you that with 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice, that we will have some fabulous success when it comes to delivering health care to those truly in need, those poor, and those over 65. That's the, that's the model to fix all this. But you can't balance the budget without significantly cutting uh, entitlement spending. And if we don't cut entitlement spending, we're going to be left with nothing. The alternative is nothing as opposed to a system that I think can be uh, implemented that will genuinely take care of those in need. How, how soon do you think we would be at the point of everybody gets nothing realistically? In other words, you agree we're after midnight now, the countdown is over, uh, our homework, uh, we were in a, a college class, we were supposed to turn in the essay, we're now two months late for handing in the essay, maybe the professor's going to say, all right, you can hand the paper in late. I'm going to take something off your grade, but, you know, you wait a couple more weeks. I'm not accepting your paper, and you fail. How far are we really from becoming a complete failure monetarily? How long do we have until, you know, complete financial pandemonium, in your, uh, in, in your uh, opinion? I, I, for, first off, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's very far. But secondly, uh, it's not something that is going to get announced. The government is not going to announce that two weeks from Thursday there's going to be a monetary collapse. So take all the money that you have now and buy whatever you can with it because two weeks from now it won't be worth anything. I'm afraid that uh, message is not going to come out, but that's exactly what's going to happen. That's what happens uh, in a monetary collapse. And, and it's, uh, it's horrible. Russia had it happen to them. And uh, to, to stem that off, uh, you start with uh, you start with flashing spending. Governor Johnson, thank you so much for your time today. The website, of course, is Gary Johnson 2012. Hang on with this final question I have for you. Looking at this entire scenario, what do you want the American public to know just about you in general? Do you, and do you feel in general that you are the one, you know, maybe one saving grace in this 2012 presidential election who could really implement real changes that we need right now? Well, that's the case that I'm trying to make, Chris. Uh, the notion that uh, Libertarian Party maybe takes the uh, best from both parties, that would be civil liberties from Democrats and fiscal responsibility from Republicans. And by the way, I don't think either one of those parties do, does well, even in the areas that they're supposed to do well. But imagine a uh, Libertarian president challenging Congress to repeal uh, the Patriot Act challenging Congress to end the drug war, and I'm talking about the Democrats, challenging them on marriage equality, and then a uh, libertarian uh, president uh, challenging Republicans 
to uh, to genuinely slash spending, to genuinely shrink government, because if we don't, um, we're, we're not going to have any at all. Yeah, and then finally, very quickly, as far as President Obama's support of same-sex marriage, wasn't that really just you know, a hollow statement to get some, you know, possible votes, but it's really not going to implement any real legislation. Uh, it, that, that is true. Uh, ultimately, it could lead to uh, legislation, but it's certainly not, uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, given that 40 plus states have said that they will not recognize uh, same-sex marriage. I think this is a constitutionally guaranteed right, and that, uh, this will end up being a Supreme Court decision that will be uh, implemented federally, just like well, civil rights. Look, if, if civil rights legislation didn't pass, would we still have segregated public bathrooms in the South? I think so. Okay. You, you, you know what? You know what? You know what? Governor Johnson, so interesting what you just said because I, you know I, I don't remember it specifically, but I certainly remember studying about school when uh, then President Kennedy literally send federal agents or federal troops, I believe it was in Alabama, so uh, a young woman could go to school uh, because she was African-American. And the, the president then did not say, well, I support the right of everybody to go whatever school they want, or I support civil rights, but I'm going to leave it to the states to administer. He said, no, this is a constitutional violation, like you said, of a, a constitutionally protected right. You find something disingenuous with what Barack Obama did. It says, well, hey, these good folks have the right to do it. Of course, I'm not going to lift much of a finger to help them in any given state case where they're disenfranchised. Is that disingenuous? I believe it is. Uh, I believe it is. And uh, yet in the same breath, it's not, it's not negative. It's positive. But it's, uh, it's removed from actually making it happen. Gary Donaldson, 2012.com, presidential candidate, 2012 of the Libertarian Party. Thank you so much. Hang on with us. For CY Interview, I'm Chris Yandek.